Good morning. Welcome to the Driller Newscast, a weekly update on the news and stories impacting the water well and industrial drilling industry. Episode 15 is brought to you by TDH Manufacturing. TDH pump hoists are built to work as hard as you do, made with the latest technology to deliver the power and precise handling required on today's job sites. TDH will provide superior performance and unmatched versatility day in and day out. Thank you, TDH, for bringing us the news and for being great innovators to the water well industry. I'm your host, Brock Yorty, and here is the news that's impacting our industry this week. Rosemont Copper Mine in Tucson, Arizona is back from Episode 7 to discuss court rulings. Next, the EPA announced a proposed rule to update the regulatory requirements for water quality certification under the Clean Water Act, Section 401. Last week, the Supreme Court allowed the Biden administration to use higher estimates challenged by Republican-led states for calculating damages to people and the environment from greenhouse gas emissions. That's pretty big. Next, the Department of Energy selected Oak Ridge National Laboratory to receive up to $6 million to help expand the deployment of geothermal heating and cooling technology at federal sites. We have a ton of great news, but before we get to it, let's talk safety. For this week's safety topic, I want to talk about situational awareness and suspended loads. OSHA states that no employee shall be under a suspended load. And that is pretty tough in an industry where we are working in tight areas under pump hoists and under rigs. Drill rigs, many of them, have helper side controls to be able to get the next rod ready so that we're able to continue to progress drilling. Often, we back in on job sites where there's been a fence or there's a building or there's now a flower garden, and we continue to make great versatile equipment to be able to reach those pumps to be able to pull them but it puts us in positions where we really need to have a heightened situational awareness that starts with all of our people understanding the known hazards at hand, what the task is going to take for the day, and how we can mitigate those risks. Now that we understand that, the first thing that I think about is what is the egress away from that suspended load? If something was to happen that piece of drop pipe, that drill rod came undone, where is your exit plan? How is your job site laid out? Make sure you have paths of egress. Next, we have to understand the fall path of that drill pipe column drill rod and its possible contact with electrical wires. Not to mention as we rig up, we need to be looking up. We need to look up before we rig up. Next, as we work in these tight corners, we end up with hand placement and other distractions. And this is a really poor situation for us to be in because it allows us to put our hands in places, pinch points and whatnot for crushing situations. So as we use those elevators and tongs and we have our pipe wrenches and how we're working on breaking these pieces out, where is our body? Where's our partner's body? How much stored energy is it going to take to be able to break apart that drill rod or break apart that column or that drop pipe? Finally, it comes down to us all working as a team, knowing where each other are, understanding the risks, understanding our tasks at hand, how we're going to handle everything, quality of lifting tooling. You know, I so often I hear that We don't fall under cranes, Brock. I understand that. We don't. But it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be looking at rigging and all of our tooling the same and understanding the risk at hand because sometimes we're in spots that are worse than what we would be if we were just lifting a large load with a crane. So once we know these risks and hazards and we've gone through our process and we have a good standard operating procedure and we've looked at our job safety analysis that the entire crew has gone over and understands, then we can make good choices and be safe. So just understand, none of us needs to be under suspended load. There's going to be situations where it's going to be tight, but we should be able to know where our body is at all times.
be safe out there. Now for news that is impacting the drilling industry this week. In episode 7, we discussed the Rosemont Copper Mine located on the western slopes of the Santa Rita Mountains, which is private land. Last week, a federal judge rejected the request by Native American tribes to stop Toronto-based Hud Bay Minerals, Inc. from preparing a planned new Arizona copper mine site in the Santa Rita Mountains near Tucson. U.S. District Judge James Soto refused to issue a temporary restraining order and dismissed the lawsuit filed by the Tono Odom, Pasquayaki, and the Hopi tribes and the group Save the Scenic Santa Rita's. This is reported by the Arizona Daily Star. Soto's ruling Monday said Hud Bay surrendered of a suspended clean water permit for a nearby project named the Rosemont Mind, which removed the lawsuit's legal basis because the projects were not legally related. The company pivoted to the Copper World Project on private land on the Santa Rita's western slopes after the Rosemont Mine ran into legal obstacles related to its location, largely on public land. Hud Bay maintains that the Copper World site on private land doesn't include stream beds, which are mostly dry except when it rains. This is exactly what we're talking about with the waters of the United States. Ephemeral streams are streams that don't use groundwater and that are mostly flowing only from rain and runoff. Stu Gillespie, an attorney for the tribe, said Soto's ruling was disappointing because it allows Rosemont to evade the regulatory process and bedrock environmental laws. The, West, the waters of the United States roundtables continue to argue the validities of what an ephemeral stream is and this wasn't a big deal with the original 2015 waters of the united states it was in 2019 when we rolled back to the navigable water protection rule so what are these streams they are streams that are flowing water only during and for a short duration after preci precipitation events in a typical year Ephemeral stream beds are located above the water table year-round. Groundwater is not a source of water for these streams. Runoff from rain is the primary source of water for stream flows. We're right back to the waters of the United States in the first story of the week. The waters of the United States will encompass ephemeral streams, which the 2020 rule had removed from the jurisdiction. This is a significant change for the arid west where a majority of water features are ephemeral tonight june 13th 2022 is the live stream for the amigos bravos which is the southwest from 3 p.m to 5 30 p.m eastern go to epa.gov look up waters of the united states find that round table be part of it listen to it and let's see where this goes from here next we're back to the clean water act this is from washington last week the united states environmental protection agency announced a proposed rule to update the regulatory requirements for water quality certification under clean water act section 401 this proposed rule would strengthen the authority of states territories and tribes to protect their vital water resources while supporting an efficient predictable and common sense certification process restoring a long-held right which was severely limited by the 2019 and 2020 previous administration rules so what we're talking about with hud bay minerals and what's happening in the western united states for 50 years, the Clean Water Act has protected water resources that are essential to thriving communities, vibrant ecosystems, and sustainable economic growth, said the EPA Administrator Michael S. Reagan. EPA's proposed rule builds on the foundation by empowering states, territories, and tribes to use congressionally granted authority to protect precious water resources while supporting much-needed infrastructure projects that create jobs and bolster our economy. 
The proposed rule is a key milestone in the regulatory process announced in May of 2021 to revise the 2020 Clean Water Act Section 401 certification rule. The proposed rule would update the existing regulations to be more consistent with the statutory text of 1972's Clean Water Act and clarify elements of the 401 certification practices that have evolved over the 50 years since the 1971 regulation was put into place. We're talking about the Clean Water Act being 50 years old and the fact that most of our infrastructure in our country was already established. And yes, we have mines and we have farming projects and we have a civilization to progress, but at the same time, we need to be protecting our groundwater and our surface waters. The EPA conducted pre-proposal engagement to help inform the content of its proposal. Again, they're calling for questions, comments, and concerns, and this is the time to get involved. Congress provided authority to states, territories, and tribes under Clean Water Act Section 401 to protect the quality of their waters from adverse impacts resulting from federally licensed or permitted projects, mines, under Clean Water Act 401, a federal agency may not issue a license or permit to conduct any activity that may result in any discharge into a water of the United States unless the state, territory, or authorized tribe where the discharge would originate either issues a Clean Water Act Section 401 water quality certification or waives the certification. We're going to see that previous story. It's coming right back up. We should all be paying attention to this. The agency is taking comments on this proposed rule for the next 60 days, beginning on the date it's May 2022, and it will publish these in the Federal Register. For more information on submitting written comments or proposals or to register for the virtual public hearing on the proposed rule, go to www.epa.gov backslash CWA-401. Again, it's all in the news right now, not just in the groundwater industry, not just what we're talking about in our associations or at Farm Bureau or at large industrial drilling conferences. This is the stuff that we need to be paying attention to and we need to be part of because we need minds so that we can be independent and we can continue to progress technology we need farming to be able to feed everybody in the country, not to mention around the world, and we need clean water. So we need to be part of these discussions right from the beginning. And now on to some more clean energy news. It's from Washington, D.C. The Supreme Court last week allowed the Biden administration to use a higher estimate challenged by the Republican-led state for calculating damages to people and the environment from greenhouse gas emissions. The justices did not comment in refusing to put back into place an order from a federal judge in Louisiana that had blocked the administration from putting greater emphasis on potential damage from greenhouse gas emissions when creating a rule for polluting industries. Here's the approach. It uses what's called a social cost of carbon to calculate future climate damages to justify tougher restrictions for fossil fuels, transportation, and other industries. The Federal Appeals Court in New Orleans put the order on hold and the Louisiana led nine states in asking the high court to intervene. The justice's refusal to do so allows the administration to use an interim standard of $51 in damages per ton of carbon dioxide emitted while it works to update and possibly increase the cost per ton. The $51 figure was used by the Obama administration before the Trump administration cut it to $7. By itself, the estimate does not impose any new requirements, but it could be used to justify tougher rules. The states would be free to challenge any new regulations. These regulations are set in place so that we can get smarter on clean energy and emissions and transportation and industry. 
and it's going to become as we grow in population and we look at the three largest states in the country, Texas, Florida, and California, it's a big deal. And that's why this is continuing to be part of our news. Now on for our main story of the week. We're going to go back and talk about the exciting things that are going on in geothermal. New technical assistance capacity will help federal government lead by example in demonstrating benefits and potential of decarbonizing buildings with geothermal energy. The United States Department of Energy last week selected Oak Ridge National Laboratory to receive up to $6 million to help expand the deployment of geothermal heating and cooling technology at federal sites. The federal government is the nation's largest energy user consuming nearly 1% of all end-use energy in the United States. Installing these carbon-free heating and cooling systems at federal sites will support the goal to make the federal government carbon neutral and help demonstrate the benefits and potential of geothermal heating and cooling. Geothermal heating and cooling is the renewable, versatile, and critical to decarbonizing buildings as well as the economy as a whole, said Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy, Kelly Speakman's Bachman. Scaling up deployment of geothermal heating and cooling technology on federal sites will help reduce costs and energy demand, ultimately saving tax dollars and leading by example to decarbonize our economy. This funding will provide technical assistance for geothermal energy deployment at federal sites, helping reduce or replace electricity demand, offset peak loads to the grid, and add resiliency and security to local energy systems. The team receiving this funding is led by Oak Ridge National Laboratory and includes three other national labs, two universities, a state agency, and an industry partner who all bring strong expertise in the low temperature geothermal space. Oak Ridge National Laboratory and its partners, National Renewable Energy Laboratory, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, Illinois State Geological Survey, Oklahoma State University, University of Wisconsin, and wait for it, everybody, the International Ground Source Heat Pump Association, IGSPA. We should all be members. If you're a water well driller, you should be drilling geothermal any chance you can get. Thank you, IGSPA, for being part of this. They will all establish a technical assistance framework with an innovative workflow that will result in more accurate models and recommendations, as well as deployment-ready reports. The team will also conduct data analysis, carry out research, resource characterization, perform site surveys, and design geothermal heating and cooling systems in support of deploying geothermal energy at federal sites. We are in such an awesome opportunity right now in the drilling industry to be part of two things, and we've talked about them what's going on with the waters of the United States, the regulation that is to our water, the Clean Water Act regulations, including the limitations with PFAS and what we're seeing with Superfunds, and we'll get into that next week. Those are all big things we need to be part of. And the reason we're having big discussions about ephemeral streams and droughts and the impact on water and why water isn't so important to us comes right back to carbon emission and greenhouse gases and climate change. And so if you're a water well driller and you have the extra capacity, you should be teaming up with an HVAC company, with a geothermal engineer, looking at these federal buildings, looking at schools, looking at universities, and all of the residential homes that could 100% be on geothermal. It's roughly about 20 million private water wells out there right now in the U.S. We should figure out how many of them have geothermal heating and cooling 
and you already have a rapport with them, it's now time to go back, drill three, four, five more holes and get them some good, clean energy that will help continue promote this. A lot of big things going on right now in the United States and water legislation, the waters of the United States and clean energy. And we need to be part of all of it. I'd like to thank you for joining us for episode 15 brought to you by TDH Manufacturing. Every vision and feature that TDH has engineered is with one goal in mind, to enable the contractor to increase their revenue simply because their pump hoist is more efficient. Give Scott and the team a call. They're innovating and coming up with new ways for us all to do our job better at pulling pumps and servicing our customers. And it's awesome because it's all coming from field experience and what Scott and the team believe you need to be more advanced than what we are now. Thank you, TDH. It's been a crazy week with discussing clean water, WOTUS, Department of Energy, Net Zero. Let's pay attention to all of these. We have the Waters of the United States Roundtable that is happening again tonight, June 13th for the Southwest. And that should be an excellent discussion to listen in on. Check out thedriller.com. Got great things coming up. The Jubilee will be happening before we know it in about six weeks. We've got a lot of great advertisers that'll be there. Let's be safe. Let's be productive. I know right now we're all thinking it's almost 4th of July. But we got several weeks of good, safe work that needs to be productive before we get there. Be safe, everyone. Mm -hmm.